Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for all your time this uh, today to spend with us. And as you can see on the agenda here, we're talking about student success through student engagement. And then the two main things that we want to share with you today are the power of storytelling and also the math. And is it math or is it really arithmetic that we're working with our students? And then we'll end today with the Q&A. So to start with, if we can all just sit back for a minute and think about it, why do we choose to be educators? Or perhaps why do we choose to be trainers? Well, because we want to work with students. We want to work with people. We want to see people to succeed. Um, my students sometimes laugh at me and they go, well, why do you want to keep on teaching? You can go back to the industry and you can make a lot more money. We get bonuses and all that. You guys don't get bonuses at university. And, and they're very true. But I'm sure that all of you who are educators know that that's what we get into education. And how do we make students successful? And one thing is to get them engaged, is to somehow increase that degree of attention, their curiosity, their interest, and that passion. And that was a word in the title that we had today. And we want to increase that level of motivation as well so that they can accomplish and achieve what they want to do. And so what do we do? How can we do what? There's so many things that we can do, but one thing that John and I want to share with you is the power of storytelling to increase engagement. Hi, so Phyllis, could you share your screen real quick? Huh, sorry. No worries, it stopped sharing on us here. Okay. Let's try this. Is this, does it work now? Perfect. Okay. So. Why are we using stories? Now, the stories is something that is not threatening. And so we think that story has some power in it. And then when you tell stories, you add yourself to it, you add the students to it and so on. It serves an attention getter. And some stories, you can get the students to participate with you and you link to the experience. And by doing that, you're making something real. Instead of you just spending, you know, the next hour and a half to talk to them about cost controls or whatever it is and a bunch of numbers and all that, now you are making something real for them. And more importantly is that we find story sticks. And think about, you know, things that you've learned when you were a kid. You might remember certain stories that your parents tell you or your grandparents tell you or some experience that people share with you. But you may not remember a lot of facts, but stories somehow always sticks. And one more thing that John and I believe is that they kind of make us more approachable, that we're not just somebody standing in front of them in the classroom and just telling them, what they need to do, what they need to learn. But we are somebody that is a human being, that we have stories too. And somehow our stories may even link with each other. So we will start with, and I'm so sorry here with my computer. Okay, we will start with this first story and John will take us and start our storytelling for today. Thank you, Agnes. These uh, stories are from my consulting and my industry days. On uh, one occasion, I met the Swiss general manager of a very nice five-star hotel. I better not say which one. But anyway, I, I asked him, what kind of information would you give to students today? And he says to me, in his very heavy Swiss accent, Jean, first you have to know how to steal the chicken before you can stop somebody else stealing the chicken. And you know, that stayed with me and I checked with some of my students that have now graduated and gone on and they are managing big hotels. I asked them, is this still happening? They said, absolutely, Dr. Walker. Yes, it is. So you have to be careful and also know how to steal the chicken before you can stop somebody else stealing it. Agnes? Ah, another one was a chef who was on the fiddle. This was a consulting job. Uh, the uh, owners and the bankers uh, needed someone to come in and stop the bleeding financially. In this particular occasion, it was a food and beverage operation. The chef 
uh, was a very uncooperative Frenchman who, uh, when I decided it was time we'd take an inventory to get started, have a base uh, for comparison, he reluctantly got the stores uh, more or less ready. And we took inventory, calculated the food cost percentage, came up with 42%. 42%, you don't run a hotel on 42% food cost. So um, we discovered eventually that this chef had a relative who owned a hotel. So he was ordering the food, not only for us, but also for the restaurant. So obviously I had his uh, request for food, his, uh, his orders placed on the desk in the food and beverage manager's office. And between us, we made those orders. And we eventually turned the screw tighter so that he, eventually this chef decided he was going to leave. He quit on a very busy banquet night, a banqueting suite full of guests, two big dinner parties going on in a conference about to go and have their dinner. Well, he quit. And we knew that the operation needed some time to get the food ready and up and out. So between the general manager and I, we looked at a recently installed fire detection equipment. We went over and we pulled the fire alarm, got all the guests out of the hotel, asked the food and beverage service, please serve champagne to all the guests and uh, we'll be ready soon. Well, that gave us time to take off our jackets and get into the kitchen mode <laughs> and get the food ready and up with the surface. It was delayed, but it was also good. That was the chef on the fiddle. You've always got to be sure that you control things by you are the one who's facing the orders, not the chef or anybody else for that matter. Thank you. Well, another hotel that I happened to have uh, uh, an affiliation with was uh, in the Caribbean. And there was a co-owner who was an invalid and unfortunately, we found somebody was stealing, but we didn't know who. And that's sometimes the problem. After taking inventory and calculating, we could realize we had a problem, but we didn't know who the problem was. And eventually one day, my assistant, whose name was Mr. Sobers, called me up at two o'clock in the morning and said, we caught him. I said, oh good, who's that? It was the co-owner's favorite employee. And he said the reason he was stealing was because his new girlfriend wanted more things, uh, you know, jewelry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he decided he was going to get what she wanted, but it was gonna come out of the hotel. No, sir, no, it does not, not anymore, because he was caught and he was put in jail. Next. Ah, room service, a five-star hotel, Central City Hotel. What the room service guys were doing was any beverages left over, usually alcoholic beverages in the guest rooms. So as room service employees, they had access to them. They would bring this down and they would fill up bottles of scotch and gin and vodka and brandy and so on. And they would be reselling this stuff or reusing it. And they were keeping it up in the ceiling above their operation until security found it one day. And of course, several of them were in serious trouble. Obviously they lost their jobs. But you, you know that these things can happen and it's amazing how ingenious some people can be to make them happen. So 100% is 100% always. Control the big items and that will help a great deal. The only way to be 100% is to check everything. And then I had something I wanted to add about uh, student engagement. Three things besides obviously guest speakers. One of them is role playing when uh, you can create a situation and you ask the students to play various roles and that encourages participation and engagement. The next one is pick a controversial topic 
that the students debated for a while and take a vote on it and then ask people how and well, why did you vote this way and and listen to the answers and the third one is buzz groups where you again have a particular topic and you say well what do you think about tipping or no tipping what would you do uh, the buzz groups you know talk about it and then they can report to the whole class and you can write down everything that people say so you've got a very comprehensive answer thank you Thank you, John. And as you just heard, there are so many great stories and each story can be then linked to a topic. So let's look at these two boxes of bacon here. And the topic is where's the bacon? And what's the story behind it? So I would tell the students before we get into a topic, this story first. And I would say, well, one time I was working with a group of managers and they were all restaurant managers. And these particular restaurants do a lot of breakfast business. And so this one manager, before we started talking about this particular topic, she raised her hand and she was very confident. Actually, she was so proud. She said, I want to share something. I said, yes, please. And she goes, well, one time I ran out of bacon and everybody looked at her and they go, well, how, how could you run out of bacon? And she goes, well, I just, I don't know. We didn't order or they didn't come in, whatever, but I ran out of bacon. But you know what? And she goes, from there on, every time I will have at least 15 boxes of bacon sitting in my walk-in. And then we all looked at her too and go, wow, 15 boxes of bacon. And for those of you who work in food service, you know that these boxes are 15 pounds per box. So 15 pounds per box, 15 boxes of bacon is 225 pounds of bacon. Now bacon is not cheap and we all know that we shop at our grocery stores. So even when you buy wholesale, it's still not a cheap product. So you're putting at least $1,000 of bacon in your refrigerator that you may or may not use. And she's using that as her new car stock. So after we talk about that story, well, as John said, we can ask students and go, well, what do you think about that? You know, use that critical thinking part and see if they're thinking, well, should she use 15 boxes of half, 15 boxes of bacon in her refrigerator and so on? Because the idea now is to get students to think about what is the right par stock? What is the right amount of par stock that you should be kept in there? Then you get students to start talking and hopefully they will say something like, well, shouldn't she look at how many items in her menu that have bacon first before she order 15 boxes? Or how much bacon does she use on a daily basis? And so on before she order 15 boxes. So now you're getting student engagement as well. So again, start with a story but link that story to a particular topic that you are talking about that particular day and then get students involved and then you get the engagement that you're thinking about. So let's switch gear a little bit and talk about the next part which is math or arithmetic. And by the way, the story part will come back again in just a minute too so we can see how all these things work together. So. Every time when we're teaching a class in cost controls or anything that has math, students will always say, well, I, I don't know if I can do well in your class. I mean, I'll try, but I've always been bad about math. And you ask them, what do you mean? And they go, no, I'm not good at it. And I, I'm just, I have a fear of number even. And if you think about it, all the things that we're doing in cost controls and so on, they are nothing but addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And they're just numbers. And numbers, as we said over here, not necessarily evil, it's just plain necessary, okay? Because these are money that we're dealing with. We are running a business. The students are gonna go out there and run business. And more importantly, we we'll always stress to the students that, and you know what, your bonuses and your success, whether you'll be promoted or not, depends on your numbers as well. And the good thing about numbers is that when you do it right, there's no gray areas. Okay, it's either you make money or you don't make money. So you've got to know about your numbers. So with that, we'll go into different things on a daily basis and talk about formulas and all that. Now again, formula, right? That's just very overwhelming. So when you ask students, what formula would you use to determine the amount of product consumed during a particular accounting period? And of course, we all use this formula, right? Oh, opening inventory, you add purchases, and then you got to look at 
purchases, but it's just, just purchase, or do we have purchase returns and allowances and so on? Then we add everything together. We have our total available for use. Then we take our closing inventory minus it, and it's the amount consumed. Now, it may make sense to us because we've done a lot of these things, but for an 18 year old or 20 year old, and they are not taking only our class, but many other classes, suddenly this becomes just another formula to them. And worse still, if we put numbers next to it, it's just totally, as they said, overwhelming. So what do we do? Well, let's use an example of a birthday party. Now, John said earlier that we talk about stories. And John also said that, well, we get students involved. We get them to be part of the story. So let me ask um, Megan. Megan, do you mind unmuting and help me out with this story? Sure, not at all. Okay, so this is what we'll do in a classroom. That's what I do in a classroom all the time. I will get students to be part of it so that they can help me out with the story as well. So Megan, we know that you have a birthday coming up. Now you may not, but you're gonna help me and say yes, right? So- <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So with, if you ask a student, you do the same thing with them. And then you go, now, now you got Megan, but you want to just, you, you don't want to just talk to Megan. You want to talk to the entire class, right? So now you turn your attention to the class and go, hey guys, you know, how many of you know Megan? Some of them may raise their hand, some of them may not. And you say, you know what? Megan is really a very nice girl. And actually on her birthday, she is thinking that she's going to invite the whole class to her apartment and have a birthday party. And so you can see people like, you know, paying attention a little bit more now, instead of me talking about beginning inventory and any inventory and so on. So I'll say, um, okay, by the way, guys, you all are less than 21 years old. Oh, okay, maybe one or two of you are over 21, but let's play it safe. So can somebody tell me what is a, a non-alcoholic drink that you want to be able to participate and partake at Megan's birthday party? So now, as John said, you're getting the class involved too. So some may yell out, oh, well, um, Diet Coke. Some may go Pepsi. Some will go, and then you have the Coke and Pepsi war starting, right? So you get people to ask a few things and answer a few things, and now you go back to the birthday girl. So Megan, it's your birthday. So what would you like to serve? Pepsi it is. Pepsi it is, okay. So now Megan walks to her refrigerator and open a refrigerator. And in there are two cans of Pepsi. Now we have a class of 60 people. So obviously two cans is not gonna make it. So Megan went to the store and bought 120 cans of Pepsi. Now it comes in 12 per case, right? So she bought 10 cases of Pepsi, 120. Are we okay so far? So you ask the students, so again, get them involved. So we said, okay, now we all went to Megan's home and we have a wonderful party. She served her Pepsi, but she also had birthday cake and so on. And by the way, while you guys were having this wonderful birthday party, you actually were talking about the things that we learned in this class. So now you get the students again, thinking about not just the birthday party, but coming back to our class. And then you go, you guys had a big birthday party. Everybody's happy, ate a lot. And at the end, you all went home and you're happy. Now, Megan is done the cleaning and she opened up a refrigerator and at the end, she saw 10 cans of Pepsi left. If there are 10 cans of Pepsi left in the refrigerator and there's nothing else, everything is consumed, how many cans of Pepsi are consumed? So now the students will have to think a little bit. So let's think about this. How many cans did we start it with? We started with 122. 122, because we had two, and then she bought 120, so it's 122. So how many are left over? We ten. have 10. Right, so mm -hmm. how many have we all drank? Uh, it would be 112 were drank. 112, because 122 minus 10 uh, is 112. So see, now you're using a story, but you get a particular student involved. Now, Megan's name is going to be all over the place right now because and everybody now, now knows that she loves Pepsi. And then everybody in the class has a part in this story. So you can build everything together. But when this is done, that's when you go, oh, let's work an example right now. Okay. Can you all see the screen again? 
All right. So let's do an example. So you take them from a story to now this particular example, and then you work this out with them and say, hey, look at this. Look at the lobby bar. It's right by the sea right there. Wouldn't we all want to be there right now? So, OK, we'll go there one day. But right now, let's look at this first. So you go, the lobby bar has a beginning inventory of beverages of 10,200. During the month, you bought another 48,250 as beverage inventory. And at the end of the month, after taking the fiscal inventory, there is one, uh, 15,133 left in the storeroom. So what is the amount of beverage inventory that you need to adjust? In other words, how much beverage inventory was consumed? Now, so you go back to the story that you just talked about Megan, and you go, remember how many cans that she had? How many did she, bought, uh, did she buy? And then how many were left? So you will take them step by step and go, okay, it is really only adding and subtracting. Why? Because your opening inventory was to $10,200. And now you're adding, buying another 48,000. So altogether is 58,450. Just like Megan's birthday party, we had 10 cans, we bought 120 cans. So now we have 120, um, 130, well, actually uh, two cans, I'm sorry, two cans, and 120, so I have 122 cans. That's the total available. When you take away the closing inventory, that becomes your amount consumed, okay? So now you can tell them that it is not this big formula that you need to memorize. Just think about any time that you do this type of question, think about Megan's birthday party. Think about what you need to add, what you need to subtract, and it's only adding and subtracting, that's it. So that's how you put the story and the math together and show them that, hey, it's not that difficult. So let's do another example of how we can get students involved and look at numbers and so on. I'm sure as a student, we all, when we got to a new place and start being a student at that new university, if they don't live in the dorms, they have to live in the apartment. So some apartments are wonderful, beautiful with a lovely swimming pool. Some are a little bit older and so on. So when you get an apartment, you ask the students now, don't you have to sign a lease? And they go, oh yeah, yeah, we have to sign a lease. Then you go, well, this is our next topic, which is about leasing. Now we can talk about leasing an apartment, leasing a beautiful Lamborghini right there with a golden color, or maybe leasing a truck for us to deliver goods and our food to our consumers, or maybe leasing some office equipment like a car here and so on. But leasing has a lot of things that have to go with it because when you look at lease, actually there are three types of lease. So now you get them to a story to the exact topic that you wanna talk about and also give them some lecture along the way. And it's not just plain PowerPoint and go, okay, this is a fixed lease, this is a variable lease, this is a mix, mixed lease, whatever, and so on. You go from getting their personal opinion of signing a lease as a student to get an apartment to think about, now your lease is a fixed lease because every month you pay the same thing. But when you're in business and you maybe lease a copier or something like that, it may be a fixed, a variable or mixed lease. And the same thing in business, when you are signing a lease to rent a space, it may also be a fixed a variable or mixed lease. So now that's when you want to stop a little bit and give them some examples of what is a fixed, a variable or mix. And basically fixed is that doesn't matter how much money you make, you pay the same amount or how much you used it is the same amount. Variable is the more you use, the more you make, you get, uh, you're going to pay a percentage of it and mixed will be a mix of the fixed and variable. So once you finish the lecturing part, you want to always back it up with an example. So again, you work with them on an example. Here we have an example of a um, fast food operation. And you can always get students involved and you go, now how many of you want to start your own business? And invariably, there'll be people raising their hands in the classroom. I want to start a business. And you ask them, so what do you want to start? And so on. Most of the times, some ladies will go, well, I want to start a bake shop. And now guys want to be 
baking, you know, bakery chef too, because they see all these things on Food Network. Some will go, I want a restaurant, and some will go, I want a limited service hotel, and so on. So we go, all right, let's again start with a small example. Now, how many of you have been to a shopping mall? And all of us have, right? And you ask them, how many have been to the food court of a shopping mall? And again, many of us have. All of us have, if not, you know, many of us. So we go, let's try this. Let's say that you found a perfect spot for your fast food operation in the new shopping mall. And you talk to the rental agent and the rental agent came back and gave you three choices, a variable lease, a fixed lease, or a mixed lease. Now, we just, John and I kind of color coded this and go variable, we put it in green, fixed, we put it in yellow and so on. You don't have to do that, whichever you want to do. But we just want to highlight it to the students and go, now, if it's a variable, the rent that you will pay is 5% of your sales. So the more you make, the more you pay. If it is fixed, it doesn't matter how much money you make, you only pay $55,000 a year. Now, if it's a mixed lease, then they charge you what they call a base minimum rent of $25,000. But if your sales is over $350,000, any dollar that's over $350,000, you pay 3% of it on top of the $25,000. Now, before you start working with them and doing all these numbers, again, get them involved, right? You talk to them about this little story already, but now you're gonna ask them, now how many of you want to, when you sign a lease, that you want it to be just a variable lease? Because think about it, right? If you don't make that much money, you don't pay that much, right? So you, let's see how many people raise their hand. Again, you want your students to be interactive with you. And so they'll raise their hand and go, okay, good. So you recognize them and you remember who they are and so on, right? Then you go, how many of you want to have a fixed lease? The same thing, some other people will raise their hand. The same with the mixed. Now, after you have explained all this to them, you will go, now let's take a look at our scenario here. We actually have three scenarios. The first one is that we made $500 in sales. And let's see which one is the best. The next scenario is that we only make $200,000 in sales. And let's go through the whole thing again, variable, fixed, or mixed, and see which one is best. And finally, we just have a great year and we make a million dollars in sales. And let's see which is better, all right? So we don't know until we look at the numbers. So let's start. So again, you get the students started. So we go with the first one. At $500,000, remember the fixed is fixed. Doesn't matter how much I make, doesn't matter how much you make, you have to pay $55,000. So the first one is always right there, 55. The variable will be 5% of the sales. So 5% of the $500,000 is the $25,000. Now the mixed would be, you pay 25, that's the minimum, then anything over 350, so that's why you use the 500 minus the 350 because you don't pay anything that is less than the 350. So from 351 to 500, that $150,000, you'll pay 3% on. And you do the math with them. Again, show them. It is strictly adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. That's it. No, none of these drawing curves and quadratic equation and all those things. So now you have this in front, and then you engage them in a discussion. So remember, those of you set variable lease, you guys got it. Now at this rate, yes, I'll agree with you, it's a variable lease, but I'm not sure about the other two. Maybe the other two are correct too, if they're at another sales level. So now you go to the other sales level and engage your students again in a discussion. So in this case, you only have $200,000 in sales. Oh boy, you still have to pay $55,000 in the fixed lease. Doesn't matter how much. So certainly the variable lease students feel like, hey, I'm winning over here. Look, even at 200,000, I'm paying the least. So I'm doing the right thing. I make the right decision. And the mixed lease people go, hmm, okay. I have to pay the $25,000 bare minimum, but I didn't make my 300, so it was zero. So, okay, I have to pay at least 25,000. So you got 
everybody again thinking what they told you at the very beginning are the right or the incorrect answer. Then finally, we go to the $1 million. Now, even at the $1 million, take a quick look. The fixed lease is still the highest. Now, obviously, as the sales goes really high, then the fixed lease will go down. The variable lease, a million times 5%. And again, get your students, get the calculators out, multiply and so on. Make sure, I always tell students, check my math. Make sure that my $50,000 is correct too, that I didn't put an extra zero or anything like that. And again, with a mixed lease and so on. But at the very end, I always ask them this. Now think about this. We have 500,000, 200,000, and a million dollars. That's sales of the whole year. So let me ask you this. You guys have been to the mall and all that. How much do you guys spend when you go to a food court at the mall? And so people start thinking and they go, oh, I'll buy an entree, I'll buy a soda and you know maybe a cookie or something like that at one store, let's say $10, all right? So now you're gonna engage them to think a little bit more. If I have a million dollars in sales and everything, everybody on the average spent $10, then now I have to serve 100,000 people to make a million dollars in sales. I just take off one zero, 100,000 people. Then you are gonna ask them, how many days do you think you will open the store for, right? You're in a mall. So a mall is probably open what? 365 days, right? They might close a little bit early for Christmas and all that. So you ask them, divide that $100,000 by 365 days. That means you have to serve 276 guests per day to make that million dollars. Is it feasible? And then they go, well, yeah, every time I go there, there's a line there. And then you're going to ask them this question. Okay, but what time do you normally go there? Oh, on a Saturday. Well, yeah, because that's the time that we can take off, right? But have you been there at a mall at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday? So you get them to start thinking. And guess what? You now are preparing them to go to something that you will talk about later on, which is forecasting. Or if you have talked about forecasting already, then you can tell them, see, that's what we talk about in forecasting. So again, using stories like that, we are making numbers less scary to the students and have them involved in the teaching part. So we don't look at ourselves as teachers. We really look at ourselves as facilitators. So John and I really want to thank you for your kind participation today and being so um, attentive and so on. And we would love to answer any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, is there an area of cost control that you found is more difficult than others to find story examples for? Um, I, I'm going to take a, a step first. John can help me out too on that. Um, a lot of times it's probably the storage of food because most of our students work in the front of the house. Not many of them work in the back of the house. So when you look at storage and you know recycling the food and making sure that you do first in first out when the old um, goods are being used first so that everything is fresh and so on. So you've got to then ask them, now how many of you do work in a restaurant? And just tell them, you know, guess what? Next time when your supervisor or, you know, somebody who's doing inventory, ask them if you can join them and just learn from them. I bet you they would love to have somebody to help them and they would love to show you what's going on. So you're actually getting your students to be, you know, thinking a little bit about more. Um, but normally it's the back of the house that is harder to, not for us to find um, quite, uh, the stories, but more for the students to identify that way. And John, would you like to add something to it too? No, I think you elaborated very well. Okay, perfect. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that you guys have authored a textbook on cost control, um, called Cost Control in the Hospitality Industry. Um, and since your teaching style is so approachable is does your approach in the textbook kind of 
mirror that. I know it does a really good job of being very comprehensive and well-rounded. What's what's sort of the the teaching approach that you take in the textbook? Well, of course, we can put the stories in the textbook, but we also um, have examples and so on, and we have uh, practice exercises as well. And we also, now the math part especially, we look at um, certain areas that students might find a little bit more challenging with the math part. And we actually taped some um, videos and, you know, with PowerPoint slides and so on, so students can follow. So you can just give them or, you know, put that video link in into your Blackboard or onto your Canvas and so on and share with the students. Even if you don't use Blackboard or Canvas, um, you will have the link to it and you can just share with the students that way as well. Perfect. And now, the focus of the book isn't just on food and beverage like some of the others. It's more comprehensive. It covers more areas of the hospitality industry. Excellent. So it's very competitive on the market then is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then I, we, we have another question as well. Uh, do you find storytelling in cost control online class as effective as in person? And if not, how do you adjust your approach for an online class? Well, you can do short video clips. I keep, keep them fairly short and link them to the text. That's the way to go, Agnes? Yes, and, and that's very true. And that's a good question too, because it is so different, right? Because when it's online, the students can't see you. You can't see them. So I'm, I'm with John. Tape the stories, put it online too, so that the students can kind of listen to those stories at the same time, that will be great, yes. Perfect. Uh, someone in the chat mentions that they really love the idea of using the stories to sell concepts and that this might work well for new employees and in scenarios when dealing with board members and clients who do not have F&B experience. That's a very good comment. I, I just think that, and John and I have pretty similar um, ideas on this, is that we just feel that storytelling, and we call it storytelling, but really is to just share what we know with students. But we don't want to just be it one way. When we do this, we always want to get the students to tell us too what their stories are. And it's amazing once you get that going, they trust you more. They see you as a, as we said, you know, more approachable. They will come down after class and start talking to you or that they will start emailing you or texting you and so on, you know, on Teams and all that as well. And you start having that relationship with the students that they don't feel scared to come and ask you a question. Because in, in the old days when we just talk and the students just sit over there and they take notes and so on, that's really the old days. We, we just can't do that anymore. Students nowadays are really more engaging. They, they want that engagement. And although we do teach a lot of things online right now, and, and John hit it right there too, and thank you for um, the, the, um, the participant who asked that question about online classes. When you tape things online, even if you're taping a, uh, a lecture online, just like what we're doing right now, parts of it is the storytelling too. Now, I can ask a student, you know, I don't have a Megan there that I go, okay, what about your, you know, birthday party? What do you want? And so on. But you can maybe get somebody to tape that with you, you know, get uh, another faculty on that day um, to, to tape that with you and then share with the students that way or find a student to be um, on this taping with you before you share that with the student, uh, with the whole class as well. And I have actually even assigned students to write a case study, which means they can go out into industry, talk with the industry uh, participants and write a case study, which then if it's good, can be brought into class and have somebody else answer it. And then a general discussion on the topics. Good idea. Excellent. And then June would like to know if she can get a desk copy for adoption review and absolutely. We'll be following up uh, post webinar as well, providing you with 
the recording of the webinar as well as uh, the link and the contact information that if you would like to request a desk copy for review and possible adoption, uh, we can certainly help facilitate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I said, we have another comment says, I love the presentation and the ideas of narrative and storytelling. I personally feel that hospitality students really learn narratively better. Stories are very personal to different instructors. What, in your opinion, are the elements that make a good story? Mm. Experience. That is really good. Yeah, experience, because then you can show students that, you know, we, we've gone through this, we know this. And I also like to look at the student's experience, not just our experience. So when John said experience, it's really everybody's experience. Because when you can get a student to share that, so, you know, if, if we say, you know, take an inventory, for instance, and I always ask, how many have taken an inventory before? And not that many, right? Because at that level, they may not have taken inventory yet. They are not the manager or you know supervisory level yet. But they'll, you have one or two sometimes, maybe three or four that raise their hand. <laughs> so you get them to start talking. So instead of you telling your story, you start getting them to tell their story. And so the class will look at the other students and go, oh, wow, really you can do that? Or really that happened and so on. That just gets them to get into that idea more, get into that topic more. And guess what? The reason why we are teaching you this topic today is exactly why you need to know because that's what's happening out there. So I think the element of being able to connect to real life and that they are actually using it and will be using it versus it's just something that's slept on a textbook and that you need to learn because the teacher tells you that you need to learn it. I think that's the, the more important, most important. <clears throat> but the experience absolutely tying everything together. And what I you found know, really- it's, it's also great to, we can all uh, get with industry and ask them specific questions or general ones, like what's been your most amusing moment? Mm -hmm. But I had one from a student a few years ago, her name was Michelle, I'll never forget. She said, I got balled out at work yesterday, Dr. Walker. I said, oh really, Michelle, what happened? Well, this guest caught me and I wasn't smiling and he told me to smile. So you know what I did? I said, sir, now you smile and you hold that smile for eight hours, you sucker. Michelle was last heard of as food and beverage manager for major chain hotels. <laughs> but anyway, okay. <laughs> it seems like the stories that are, are really successful are like the ones that you shared kind of earlier in the webinar of this is what happens when things don't go according to plan. Mm. And this is why this concept is important. I find those really fascinating. What can you learn from it, right? We can always learn, so. Oh, yeah. uh, does anyone else have any other questions? No, doesn't look like it. Well, thank you everyone so much. Say thank you to everybody for being with us. Uh, we look forward to continuing the uh, discussion and our collaboration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yep. And like I said, we will be in touch afterwards. We'll also be sending out a poll to kind of gauge what your preferences are regarding ancillary materials when using a textbook as well. We'll be providing the link. And if you have any con uh, questions, feel free uh, to contact me or Deb Roth at D-R-O-T-H at KendallHunt.com. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for your time and have a wonderful day. Goodbye.